Um, so my name is Juanpe. I'm a freelance uh, consultant and contractor based in Berlin. And I work a lot in the domain of interactive software, uh, music software, and 3D software, stuff with highly interactive UIs. And I'm going to talk about a topic that may sound not so connected, but it is, which is immutable data structures. And the real motivation to work on immutable data structures is actually value semantics. Value semantics are a very important C++ feature. And I may ask you here, who thinks value semantics is one of the best C++ features? A bunch of people. And who here really works on software with, where most types are value types? Eh, one person here that writes Haskell, even though he hates it. Um, no, really, actually, it's hard to, to really use value semantics in the way we want to in C++. And this is what I call the tragedy of the value-based architecture. And this tragedy starts with lots of good intentions. Let's say we're writing some kind of interactive software where at the core of our software, we have some data model that represents a document that the user is editing. If we're following a value-oriented architecture, we may want to have this data model be composed of simple, nice value types. These value types may be simple types, what we have already in the language, like vectors, maps, tuples, structs. Now, when we need to write some application logic, some business logic, we're going to do it with functions that take documents by value, and then they return a new version of the document by value. We can use mutation inside the function, like we do here with assignment, but the value semantics as specified in C++ that are applied to this by value argument and by value return types protects us from the side effects. And this function is actually very easy to reason about. We can compare the input to the output. It's very easy to test. It's a very nice kind of function. Now, since we, are, since we have values, let's say we want to implement undo, which is often a hard to implement feature uh, in our software. Now it becomes simple. We just have an STD vector, let's say, with the different states of the different copies of the document as we were editing them. Let's say you have a UI and you want your UI to be responsive, so you have the rendering done in a, another thread. Well, you kind of send the document to the other thread with some kind of message queue. You communicate by passing, uh, not by sharing state and using mutexes. And once you have this copy in the other thread, you can draw it and do whatever you want with it easily. You want to, let's say, save the document to disk. This is often a slow operation, especially if your document is very big. So you just use std async to make it asynchronously. You use a lambda. You put an equal sign in your lambda capture so you make sure you have a copy. And you can save it without uni using any other synchronization primitive. Let's say you have an audio control thread. I worked a lot, as I said, in music software. It's another representation of your document, like your UI. And you probably want to have it, or actually, you must have it in a separate thread. So you may want to have a copy there also and update the audio engine and whatnot. This picture is beautiful, I think. The problem is that it's not realistic, right? Unless your documents are very small, you're doing copies all over the place, right? Like your undo history is going to be uh, gigabytes. And you're going to do this deep copy whenever you need to re-render the UI. Everything becomes very expensive. This is not practical. So a C++ developer will say, well, I, I know how to do things here. This application logic, why do I need to do it you know, uh, by value? I can just take a reference to the document, update it in place. I don't need to even return anything. And things become simple. I'm not doing copies anymore. But once you start doing this, you're not really talking about values. Now you're talking about objects. Now you have to care about what reference are you passing to things. Now you're thinking about locations, not about values in the mathematical sense of a value. And now things, well, sorry, you have references to shared state. You need to use some kind of mutex here. You cannot just in the render thread start looking at the document um, in, in your own local copy. And this is probably expensive, so now you have an intermediate representation of your UI composed of a very uh, complicated widget tree. You need to keep all this updated when, the UI, uh, when, the, when you change the document, so you're going to have some signal slot mechanism, some queue signal, and emit with this you know, callback pattern, whatever. 
the undo history is not going to be a collection of states. It's going to be an implementation of the command pattern that you all know from the you know, design patterns book. And you have to implement your operation twice in one direction and the other and make sure that everything is symmetric, hopefully. Saving in another thread, it's just too hard to do. Forget about it. The users are already used to this nice sign, right? So it's OK uh, to make them wait for a little bit. But nothing is going to save us from the spaghetti code monster that took over our code. Oh my god. OK. What was the problem here, really? The problem, really, we, we had a very nice design, but we stepped back because of copying. And the problem is that in C++, it seems, superficially, that passing by value involves copying. But is this really the case? Is this implication really true? It is not, actually, I believe. Mutability makes this implication be true. If you want to be able to mutate the object, of course, when you pass a value to someone, you need to copy it so uh, the other mutations that you do are not visible in the original reference. But if you remove mutability, you could actually implement the assignment operator or the copy constructor in a way that just you know, copies a pointer to the internal representation, and that's it. So what if we had a kind of magical vector? This vector is not the one from the standard library. It's actually the one that we're going to focus in this talk that has all its methods called uh, marked const. This is why it's immutable. So I can have a const vector here. And I can push back things to it. But it's not going to update the vector in place. It's just going to return a new version of the, ve of the vector with the new data somehow appended to it. I can do this multiple times. I can also update um, elements of the vector. I cannot use the square brackets because the way they're defined, you know, they imply that you're going to assign to it. But we can use this set um, function to get a new version with the updated element. Once we do this, we get a property that in the functional programming world is called persistent data structure. This is not persistent in the sense of you save it to disk. It's persistent in the sense that when you update the data structure, you're not destroying the old contents of the data structures. You're kind of forking the world in the sense that Ivan actually mentioned yesterday uh, in his talk about move semantics. And this allows us to compare, as we see here in these assertions, previous values with current values. You can reason about change in an explicit way in your code. It's no longer an implicit property. property. Change is something that uh, you have explicit in your code. And this is extremely powerful, especially actually in interactive systems, where changing things is what we want to do. Um, another interesting property is structural sharing. Because as I mentioned before, now we've re we have removed this uh, implication that you need to copy all the data when you have a new version of the data structure. So even when you push back something, when you set something, not all the data that is inside the data structure is copied, only small portions of it. So all these versions, all these forks that you have uh, of the reality actually share a compact representation that is proportional to the amount of change and not to the proportional uh, to the amount of copies. And this also implies that things are fast to compare, because if a lot of things are stored in the same block of memory, in the same pointer, you can just compare the pointers and not look at the elements inside if they are equal. So I really wanted such a vector to exist, so I implemented this immutable data structure library, which is an open source project um, that is called Emer. And my focus, or my goals when implementing this library, was to do first something that is kind of idiomatic for C++ developers, because there are lots of libraries that kind of bring functional programming concepts or whatnot to C++, but they treat C++ as if it was Haskell, which means it's not so practical and not so convenient for you know, daily, day-to-day uh, -day C++ developers. It should also be performant, because if we are using C++ to begin with, it's because our domain has some performance constraint somehow. And it should be cost customizable. And this goes hand in hand with the performance thing. We need to be able to customize the data structure uh, to our domain problem. So the second part of this talk is going to talk a little bit about how this immutable vector actually works. We're going to go in search of the magical immutable vector. And to understand the principles of how you build such an immutable data structure, it's easier actually to start with a list. 
If you've done a little bit of functional programming, maybe um, you programmed in Lisp or Haskell, you've seen this is the bread and butter of immutable data structures, because you can start with a node. So here we have a list that has one node, which is this character A. And when you push new elements in the front, you just allocate new nodes, and the next pointer is pointing to the old data, right? So here, actually, we don't have three copies of the list. We actually have just the three elements in memory. And v1 and v0 are pointing just in different, to different parts of the list directly. We can push a new element, and we can also fork reality, right? So we can actually uh, uh, derive a third list that uh, shares a common, a common tail, but uh, has a different head, for example, right? But this is problematic. Even though these data structures or data structures uh, built in this way have been studied for a long time, there is the seminal work called Purely Functional Data Structures by Chris Okazaki. And I really like also this finger tree data structure. But these data structures, they are not practical for C++ in particular, because they are based on these small nodes. And we know C++ developers, small nodes means no cache efficiency. So out of the question. And uh, often they even rely on things like laziness and whatnot, properties that C++ don't have. But for me, there was some breakthrough work at the beginning of the 2000s um, with uh, Phil Bagwell and his work on immutable data structures, and then also with Rich Hickey, uh, which is, uh, who is the designer of the language closure. Because uh, Rich Hickey um, made a list uh, that is not based on list as a fundamental data structure. It's actually based on modern data structures, like vectors and hash maps. And um, they designed these data structures that are cache efficient. They are you know, uh, made for the modern world. The modern processors where working with the small nodes is not practical. And these data structures we can use um, as a foundation for C++. OK, so how do we build, then, an immutable vector? Ideally, if we wanted to have something that is worth calling a vector in some sense, you would want to have an array, right? But an array doesn't have a structural sharing. If I want to change any element in this array and keep, you know, have the persistence property, I will need to copy all the vector to be able uh, to do this. So this is not good enough. But I can make a trade-off and it slices into chunks. Now, if I want to update some part of the vector, I may have to copy the chunk, but not every element in the chunk. This is nice, but a bunch of boxes floating in the void is not a data structure. I need to assemble them together. So I can do repeating the same process, put them in another array. But now we have the same problem. This array can grow very big, and the copies can become a problem. So we slice it into chunks, and we repeat the process until we have one single root. And we have this very nice, perfectly balanced uh, radix tree, it's called, a radix balance tree, which is characterized by this constant m, which is the, the branching factor of the tree. Here we're using a branching factor uh, of four elements. And this branching factor should be a power of two. Uh, we'll see very soon why. Now, in the slides, I use blocks of size four, so they are nicely fitting in the slide, but in practice, we use actual branching factors of size 32. And there is uh, experiments that you can run to really find the optimal branching factor for a particular architecture. Um, and this has shown to be, to provide a very nice trade-off between structural sharing and um, access time, basically, because you want to keep the, the tree uh, as flat as possible, having big chunks. Um, and, OK, as C++ developers, you're thinking, this is still a tree. Trees are slow. Trees grow deep. That's why we don't like STD map. We like an ordered map. But this tree grows very slowly. You can have a vector that contains every element that you can address with a 32-bit integer, and it's only going to be seven levels deep. Experimentally, you can show that if you have data that big, the cache um, size versus the, the, the workload size have a much bigger impact than the depth of the tree in, in your problem. So how do I access an element in the tree? Let's say I want to access the element at the position 17. If I want to access this element, I'm going to look at the binary representation of the index. Then 
I'm going to um, group them, and this is why we wanted to have a power of two, by the power of the branching factor. So we have here groups of two, and we just look at each group and traverse down the tree. So the first two significant um, uh, numbers are going to tell us you know, the index in the first in the root, then the second two in the second level, then the third in the third level. How do I make a change in the data structure? How do I implement this set function that we looked at before? Well, I'm going to need to copy the block where the element is located, and then I'm going to need to copy every element, every uh, internal node that is in the path towards the element. So there is some amount of copying, but there is a lot of sharing, right? And this is what provides this nice balance. Actually, if you look at this, there is already another data structure that is very, very similar, and it's much older than actually the papers I showed. Memory pages. This is like a page table tree, and yeah, your operating system already has a persistent data structure that uh, you manipulate by using the fork system call. So this is very nice. Can we improve the data structure? Let's say we want to concatenate two vectors. This data structure, as explained here, has the same limitation that an STD vector has. There are some, um, some empty slots in the leftmost side. And since this is perfectly balanced, we cannot have empty slots in the middle of the tree. So if we have a second vector that we want to concatenate, we're going to have to copy elements to fill the slots, and then we're going to have gaps in the other side of the other vector. So in the end, we're going to actually have to copy the whole second vector in the process of the concatenation. So it's going to be an O-N operation proportional to the size of the second vector. But can we do better? We have a tree, so we can be a little bit playful. And there is actually a modification of the data structure that is called the relaxed radix balance tree, which allows some of the inner nodes uh, or some of the nodes that are not in the left or sorry, the rightmost path, path to have gaps in it. Uh, for that, you need in the inner node or the relaxed nodes, which are the ones that are not uh, full, uh, to keep track of the sizes of the subtrees. And now you can implement a complicated yet logarithmic concatenation operation. Um, so once we have this, we have uh, this map of operations where we have what we call effective O1 random access update pushback and slicing. Now we say effective O1 because in reality it's logarithmic 32. But as we said, the trees are so shallow that in practice in the measurements it's going to be almost constant. A relatively big constant, but constant. Now we have truly logarithmic concatenation insertion and push front. And this is why this data structure, when relaxed, is called a confluent data structure. Because it's not only persistent, not only can you fork the world, you can take two worlds and combine them in one uh, element via um, through the concatenation. OK. What's the next problem here? I'm showing the picture here like this, which is very beautiful. Uh, we have the elements in the leaf nodes directly, but this doesn't represent the reality of how this is implemented, let's say, in Clojure and all these other functional languages where this comes from. Because all these languages box every value, which means that actually every element that you have in the vector is put in their own cell, and the leaf nodes actually contain pointers to these elements. This is very inefficient. C++ developers don't like boxing every value. So let's put them back at the leaf directly. But now we have another problem. The elements can have different sizes. So if, let's say, the elements have the same size as a pointer, then it's going to be a picture more or less like this. But if they're bigger, oh, my leaf nodes now are bigger. So these nice properties that we have measured, actually, uh, for this constant 32, they don't no longer hold, right? Because now. Copying one of the leaves is going to be more expensive than it was before. So I made a modification to the data structure uh, where basically you say, well, 
if the things are the size of a pointer, you put as many as in the inner nodes. But if the things are bigger, you put less of them, simply. right? So if the things are twice as big, then you put half as many. If they are smaller, then you can even fit even more of them. right? And then you get even a smaller tree. And this is what I call the embedding relaxed, uh, or sorry, the embedding, em embedding radix balance tree, which is characterized instead of by one constant, two constants, right? The one that is used for inner nodes, then the second one for leaf nodes, and we can, in C++, automatically let the implementation compute the optimal leaf node size, uh, depending on the proportion of the sizes of the pointers and the sizes of the elements themselves. This is nice. But are there still problems with this little structure? Let's look at this function. This function um, is kind of similar to the IOTA function, so it takes a vector and then it pushes at the end of the vector every integer between first and last and returns a new version. There's one problem with this function. It's not a correctness problem, but if you think about it, this function is a little bit inefficient, right? Because whenever you're doing a pushback, you're copying the rightmost block for nothing, because in the next thing, step, you're going to push another element, copy it again, and deallocate the previous one. Can we do better? Well, we can say, I don't really want persistence inside this function. I want to have a transient vector that gives me actually a mutable API, so an API that has the advantage also of being compatible with the, with the standard vector API, where I'm saying, yeah, here in this function, I don't want persistence. I want every pushback to destroy, to mutate the vector. And now the implementation can be more efficient and reuse the new allocated uh, elements in the rightmost path. At the end of the function, we call persistent, and this returns, again, an immutable vector, and no side effect is visible outside of the function, right? So both the conversion to transient and the conversion to persistence uh, basically respect the persistent of the original V that you're passing in. You're not mutating that data. You're only mutating the data that is generated as part of this transaction, basically, that you're doing. Now, as I said, another advantage of this API is that now, let's say, you can use back inserter and the standard algorithms, which expect you to provide mutation uh, in your APIs. But let's look at another example. I may want to write a function like this, where I pass in a vector, return another one, and I want just to chain calls to push back, pa, 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 to do different things. And again, we have the same problem. Uh, we are potentially doing unnecessary copies in the pushback calls. But these values, the first one is a named value, right? It's what in C++ lingo is an L value. But the second ones, the second pushbacks, they're operating on R values. These are anonymous references. So here, since it's operating on an R value, and if you're using reference counting as the garbage collection mechanism that is under the hood, you can actually swap it by something else, and this property, uh, then you cannot do this. But if you're using reference counting, the pushback can look, what are the reference counts of uh, the nodes that um, are allocated in the tree, and if it's operating on an error value, when the reference counts are one, it knows that really no one else in the program is looking at those nodes, so it can mute them in place and achieve exactly the same performance that you were achieving with the transient. Now we can go further and help the compiler a little bit by, by moving v, because uh, v is not used anywhere else in the function here. And once we do this, we achieve something, actually, that we couldn't achieve with the transient API, which is to be able to compose this optimization. So if you call say hi and pass the return to another call of say hi, or let's say another function, there are no superfluous copies anywhere here, right? If you use the transient thing, you're putting these boundaries where 
superfluous copies might be inserted. Not here. So in the end, basically, you have a persistent data structure. You have immutability. But the performance is going to depend on the actual, at runtime, amount of sharing. So if there is no sharing, that is actually going to be, it's going to be as efficient, you could say, as a mutable uh, data structure. So this is a very powerful property. Now, of course, the, the function that we showed before with the transient, you can also regret it like this uh, and just move V before passing it to pushback. Now, if you want to learn more about uh, this kind of API design where you have methods that operate uh, in special ways when you're working on moved in values, I recommend you to go to Yvonne's talk uh, that was yesterday, but it's probably going to be on YouTube at some point, I guess. Uh, and there's going to be a second part in St. Petersburg this year, I think. Now, another important thing, I talked about vectors. But uh, I would say the bread and butter of data structures is vectors and hash maps. You can also do hash tables using the same principles. And there is a very nice talk by Phil Nash called the Holy Grail Hash Array Mapped Trees, which is basically a hash table implemented using the same uh, principles. Now, I'm pretty sure everybody's thinking, mm, yeah, I mean, sounds cool, but is this really fast? Well, I have lots of benchmarks. And I have an answer. <laughs> yes. Um, if you really want to look at the benchmarks, um, I actually published uh, this work in a paper for the International Conference of Functional Programming in 2017. Um, and there, you know, there is all the benchmarks plus the scientific discussion of, you know, this is really good. Um, but I think here we're not so much interested in the absolute values. Uh, we're interested in how does it actually affect our system as a whole? Because of course, I mean, updating the vector is going to be slower, right? You need to copy a few chunks of data, allocate data. That's going to be slower. Iterating over the vector is actually almost as fast as iterating over um, a standard vectors. So that's a, a very important uh, property that I wanted to achieve. Because we, of course, read data much more often than we mutate data. And it's also interesting to think that, yes, we're making the update slower, but the trade-off is we don't have to make any copies at all when making copies of the data structure. So you're kind of amortizing the, the, the time you spend updating the vector over all the copies you're doing in the system, right? So if you have an architecture like the one I presented in the beginning of the talk, uh, you're going to actually have lots of success performance-wise with these data structures. And still, I don't want you to be convinced just by my words, so I'm going to show you an example application written using these data structures. So um, yeah, to try to, to see what using these data structures mean in practice, I wrote a see, perfect. I wrote a little text editor, right? So it's a little piece of interactive software where you, uh, you know, you're editing a document. And this document is going to be, of course, represented by immutable vectors. And this text editor is called evig. And I have here a file. Wait, let me show you something. I have here a file called Esperanto Wiki, which has the contents of the whole Wikipedia in Esperanto. I'm using the Esperanto one because the English one is really, truly big. But this is a one gigabyte file. Um, I'm not sure what your favorite text editor is, but I'm pretty sure your text editor doesn't like this file. Here, I immediately get something. I see that it's loading asynchronously. I can already navigate the file, and everything keeps responsive, right? Why? Of course, the loading happens asynchronously. And uh, it's just sending you know, the new loaded data to the main thread. And everyone is doing this their thing. No mutex, no synchronization, just passing values around. Now, I can go to the end of the file. This file is here. You can see 20 million lines of code. 
Um, before we jump to the coolest things, um, there's one property that I really like about this text editor. Um, there is a little detail, but I think it really shows the power of these data structures. You see two dashes in the, in the white line at, of the, at the bottom, at the beginning of the line. If you're using Emacs, this is a familiar UI. This is actually inspired by Emacs. Um, this indicates whether the document is dirty. So I didn't make any change. If I make some changes, I start seeing some asterisks in there. Now, if I delete the new added characters, not by undoing, but by using the backspace, at some point, it recognizes that the document is not dirty anymore because it's the same as it was in the beginning. No text editor does this, right? Because all text editors, they just, you know, you do an editing command and they say, oh, now it's dirty and it's going to be dirty until you save. But here, we keep every previous version of the document. So to show the, the dirty marker, we have no dirty flag. We just say, well, is my document different than the document I loaded from disk, right? Um, I can do something else. I can use Control X H. This is Emacs for select all. I can do Alt W, copy everything. Wow, that was fast. I can go here in the middle. I can paste it a few times. How big is this file now? Wow, I can do it more times. Um, it's immediate. Why? Well, we have logarithmic concatenation, so I can just copy take the bunch of tests that I copied, in this case, well, it was a whole document, and I will just need to do a couple of concatenations that the logarithm of uh, a few millions is actually not that big in the end. So this is pretty cool. I can also save the document, and it's going to take a while because, you know, now it's actually <laughs> probably more than a few gigabytes big. Actually, maybe I shouldn't be doing this. I'm not sure I have enough disk. Um, and now it's going to wait. Uh, anyways. Uh, <laughs> Um, actually, I'm going to check how much this guy have. Yeah, something is happening here. <laughs> oh, I had enough. OK. Um, anyways. Um, yeah, this is interesting, right? Because, of course, the thing was sharing data as long as it's represented as a vector that has been derived from previous version. As soon as you save it to Lisk, it's ser serialized. So you lose the persistence property. Um, we can now go back to the slides. Uh, not this version. This one's. Um, and think a, a little bit about. Uh, OK, how is this program written now? And this yeah, is part three of our talk. It's redemption for the value-based architecture. Before talking about how it's done, let's talk about how it's not done. It's definitely not done using the traditional model view controller or the traditional Java-ish interpretation of this, which is also the way we write most interactive software in C++. Now, I mean, this is not terrible. It's a nice foundation with nice ideas. But there is one little problem here, which is that um, these boxes here, they represent a nice separation of concerns, but they represent objects, objects in the object-oriented sense, but also objects in the C++ sense of locations in memory where you have mutable state. The, ref the lines that connect the objects, they are references, so the view knows about the model directly. And even worse, the model knows about the view indirectly, because there is probably some callback uh, that the view has installed to be able to be notified when the model changes. So even with our best intentions and our best application of the solid um, object-oriented principles, these graphs of intercycled objects, they don't compose. So as your application grows, as you add models, and controllers and views, you end up with these messes where to really 
make a change to the program, you have to understand all the parts that are connected to it, all the views that are going to be updated through callbacks. And you know, you try to make a composite uh, operation out of a smaller operations, and you can't, because as you call the, intern the step, it's already emitting the callback, so you have the UI in an intermediate state, and you know, many of you probably know these kind of problems. We've all been attacked by the spaghetti code monster. Can we have a different architecture? So there is this kind of other way to interpret the, the model view controller uh, that is called the unidirectional data flow ar architecture. I didn't invent this name. This actually has been used in practice in the web world a lot. Uh, and this actually comes from a document uh, from Facebook uh, that they call it the Flux architecture. And, and yeah, there is a lot of people using this already successfully for writing web applications. Sadly, not yet for C++. And here, where well, we have similar elements in some way, we have actions, models, and views. Um, but the interesting thing is what the boxes and the arrows mean. The boxes here, they are not objects. They are not locations with mutable state. They are values. So you have action values, you have model values, and you can also even have your view represented as a value. Now the arrows here, they are not references. If you don't have objects, you cannot really have references. They are relationships. In particular, they are functions. Right? So between the action and the model, you're going to have a function that takes the current, an update function that takes the current model the current state of the world, it takes an action, which is a value representation of some event that happened uh, like a mouse event, or it can also be at some level, other level of abstraction in your application. It can be um, a business logic option, right? So it could be, uh, let's say, insert element in the document or insert character in the document action. The update function is going to take the action and update the document and return a new state of the world. Now, the model is connected to the view also by a render function that takes the model and returns a representation for the model. Now, this requires to have a nice framework that allows you to represent views as values. And in the web world, actually, you have React. Um, in C++, we don't have anything like that yet. I don't know if somebody wants to pay me to do something like that in the future. Um, but we have, for example, immediate mode APIs, which to some degree allow you to just say, well, I draw, and in the process of drawing, I'm producing a value via side effects in the screen. Uh, something like this. Now, the view has to be connected somehow to have some mechanism to dispatch actions, right? So you're going to have some way where the view or maybe some other sources of events can deliver actions into the system and put this cascade in, uh, in action. Now, there is one very simple way to implement this, which is with a loop like this. So before I added asynchronous loading and saving, this was actual code from uh, the text editor uh, that we saw. Because, of course, we need an asynchronous event loop if you want to have asynchronous loading and saving. But here we just have a terminal object, which is an object that represents, you know, it's a thing wrapper around end courses, so you can write and read from the terminal. And then we have the application. The application is basically our model value. So it's a model of the whole state of the application here, which, as we see in the declaration above, we have a function that. Um, we can use to get a new version. Then we loop and we say, well, until the application doesn't want to close, uh, we just draw the new state. We query, in this case, since we're only interacting from the terminal, we query what's the next event. Uh, and the event, let's assume here, it's convertible automatically to an action. So we can just call update and store the state in this local variable we have. Uh, and loop again. Now, what's really cool here is that in our program, there is only one mutable variable that survives the scope of the runtime of the application itself, which is this state 
uh, object, right? This state thing is really our mutable variable. This is what the closure people call sometimes the single atom archi architecture for this reason. You try to have one central point where you do all, all your mutations through, and your application logic is not concerned with uh, updating it. You have a loop like this somewhere in your application, but then your application logic is going to be in pure functions like the update function we have here. Now, when you start designing software in this way, then you also change your conception about software. You don't start with a UML diagram where you start with interfa interfaces and operations. Probably you want to start with the data, actually. What data do I have in my application? In this way, it's actually a little bit similar with this new trend of data-oriented design, even though the data-oriented design people come maybe from a performance uh, uh, point of view. They try to make things as fast as possible. Here, we're also trying just to make things a little bit simpler, or a little bit more correct, and also, why not, a little bit fast. Um, but it's a little a, a different focus with, in the end, a lot of par parallelisms in the design methodology. So. In the application, these are the core data types. So you have you know, an index. You have some coordinate in the document, which is a row and a column. And then we have the meat, actually, of the application, which is the align of text, which is a flex vector of characters. So a flex vector is the vector that is concatenable. There is also the vector type, which you cannot concatenate. Um, we have the text objects, which then is just a vector of lines. It's a very uh, simple way of representing text. Now we have things like a file. A file um, has a, a name or a file name, a, a, an address in the file system that it was loaded from, and it had a content. Here we see another uh, type of the library, which is the box. The box is a very simple type, but very handy sometimes, which is the one element container. So it's basically a way of putting something that could be expensive to copy in the heap and um, avoid the copies when you move it around. Um, we have a snapshot. A snapshot is what we're going to put in the undo history. It contains the document. Right? A piece of text, which is the whole content of the document. And it contains the cursor position, because when you undo, you also want to restore the cursor to where it was um, when the user edited. We have a buffer. This term comes from Emacs and Vim that call kind of the open documents buffers. Um, and we have the file where we loaded it from. Right? So we have the file path and the content. This is how we're going to be able to compare if the document is dirty. We have uh, the content, we have a cursor, a scroll position, uh, selection start, uh, if you're selecting, so it's optional. A vector of snapshots, that's the history. Right? There's no command pattern. We're just going to keep the previous states. And uh, if we are in the process of undoing, you're going to have an index inside the history. Then the application is going to be a document that is open maybe a key map, a current input. So if you're doing a key map combination, there is going to be a clipboard, which is a vector of pieces of text that you've copied, and maybe some messages that are displayed at the bottom of the screen. In this very first iteration of the, that is single-threaded of the application, we just have one type of action, which is basically uh, there is a key code and, um, and a, a and potentially a resize, yeah. Um, so just looking at this data, I think, like a lot of you may already, you know, think about how to implement different operations, right? Like most of them, if you do like this take by value and return by value, a lot of the operations are going to be uh, very simple. The code of the text editor is actually on GitHub, so you can look at it um, and see how it actually looks. I'm going to show you just one example of a feature, because I think it's particularly um, nice, which is undo, right? And undo, uh, as I saw in the faces of a few of you when I was talking about it in the beginning, it's a complicated to get right feature um, if you don't have the right infrastructure. Um, in the editor, I implement Emacs style undo. So I'm going to explain a little bit how it works. Uh, Emacs style undo is uh, different in that there is no redo command. 
So uh, basically, you never lose work because uh, undo is an undoable operation. So you only have undo. If you want to redo, you edit something. And as soon as you edit something, all your undos become part of your undo history, and then you can undo them as well. So you can. So let's see an example of how this works. Basically, I'm doing some edits. So I have a state one, a state two. I do another edit, a state three. The, the red marble here is just the history position, right? So as, as long as you're, you're, uh, as long as you've, you're not undoing, your history position is implicitly at the end, you could say. And at some point, ah, I did a mistake. I want to undo something. Then the marble moves to the back. But a new state is pushed, which is basically the new state that the user is seeing, which is S3. Okay? When I undo again, I take the previous state, move the cursor back. The user is now seeing S2, but S2 is also now in the undo history. Now the user is done undoing and, and performs another edit. Now the cursor position moves to the end. And the new edit is a new state S5 that the user is seeing. If the user now wanted to undo, he or she will go first through uh, the, the undid operations. Right? Um, this is all the code you need to implement undo in this way. Uh, there is two operations. There is record, and there is undo. Record is uh, oops, sorry. Record is basically what we're going to call whenever we do an operation. And this is nice. We don't even need to know if our operation is really editing the document. So this, op this function is transparent to, to your application logic. Uh, because you just call this function after any action happened. And the first thing this does is, well, did the document change? Did the text actually change, right? Because actually, this is a dynamic con condition. You sometimes, let's say, you try to delete the first character, and it doesn't delete anything because it was the first character. So you should not push something in the undo stack. Um, so if the content changed, then we push back the content and the cursor position in the history. And if um, the history position didn't change as part of the action, meaning the two buffers don't come from an undo action, uh, then the history position is now null, meaning it's implicitly at the end. Now, when we want to undo, well, we just look at the history position. And as we say, if I don't have a position, we assume it's at the end. Um, and if there is actually something in the undo history, meaning uh, it's not at the very beginning, then we actually do an undo. And we just you know, uh, look at what's at the end of the history. We uh, put the content as a current content, put the cursor as a current cursor, and uh, change the, the history index. Right? The fact that the undo operation is undoable is achieved through the record operation, right? because the record is then going to also record this undo operation as part of it. Right? So it's like, I don't know, 10 lines of code for uh, undo that is almost generic. So you can uh, you know, use this code almost vanilla uh, in any editing software you want. I think this is a very nice uh, property of this code. There is one last thing I want to show, which is time travel. It's very connected to undo. Um, so. If um, you're implementing the code with this ar architecture, right, you could extract the main loop that I showed into a little framework, uh, which I made. And then this little framework can enhance your application uh, um, automatically uh, with extra features. So I have here this Evic debug. Um, and I'm going to open a little bit smaller file for convenience. Um, this version of the text editor evac debug has some debug features enabled. And this 
means that I can now, uh, is it here? Yes. I can now open through the browser a debugger where I can inspect the state of the application. I can see what's the last action that happened. It was a resize because, of course, the window was opened and my window manager discusses a resize automatically. Um, and we can also see what's the state of the application. Of course, for this, I had to annotate the struct with some uh, reflection uh, library to be able to serialize it to JSON automatically. Uh, but other than that, this system is generic. You can plug it in any application developed in this way. I can go and look at everything that happened. So there is a load DOM action, right? So in the asynchronous loading version of this application, there are actually different actions that represent, oh, there is a bunch of text loaded from the file system. Uh, here there is a command. It's the load command. So we trigger in the very beginning a load action. And of course, there is some initial state that has no action. It's a state as it was before we triggered the load. I can even go and double click here. And the application automatically updates to uh, the state where it was before, right? So this is a very powerful debugging tool uh, where, you know, I do something, and let's say something bad happened, and I'm like, oh, shit, like, wh what happened here, really, right? And you can go back and, you know, move this, the application to that state and inspect what was going on. You can even continue using the application um, coming from that new position of the, of the history. So I think this is quite a nice property, uh, mind-blowing one maybe. <laughs> uh, and there is, if you're interested in that, another talk that I did at CPPCon, actually not 19, uh, 18, um, where I go into detail on how this uh, uh, debugger is built, actually. So I show a little bit more of that. I also show more of the value-oriented uh, design in general. Um, there is also much more I could say about, OK, how, oh, I'm actually showing you the presenter version, <laughs> um, about how the, uh, how these actions should be in reality done, how to, for example, organize them hierarchically such that you can achieve modularity in your system instead of having everything in one big update function. I also talk about asynchronicity, so how loading the file concurrently is actually implemented. Uh, there is another version of this talk that is, has a half an hour of extra content from last year. You can also check the video on YouTube uh, here in the link. I guess uh, I will post also all this in the conference uh, slides so you can look at it then. I think we looked at a lot of stuff now. We can finally reach some conclusion. And I would like to conclude with this tweet from Andy Wingo. He's actually uh, a very good developer. He uh, has worked a lot on V8 and compilers in general. He also maintains uh, the GNU scheme implementation called Guile. And he said this thing, which is to make a program slightly faster, you measure each small change against benchmarks and only keep winning changes. To maybe make it a lot faster, you blindly invest a lot of effort on the basis of intuition and gut instinct, a weird dichotomy, right? And I think with C++ developers, we are experts on the first one, right? You give me a closed domain, and I'm going to optimize it by making small changes and measuring to the limits of what's possible. But we less often try the second path, which is a risky path. Sometimes you end up somewhere completely useless. But often, by just redesigning your program in a different way, sometimes even in a simpler way, uh, you can actually also achieve uh, better performance. Uh, so I will hope you are convinced to maybe try this approach, to maybe try and say, hmm, maybe Doing things by value is not such a bad idea. I should not be so obsessed about the individual mutations I'm doing in my applications. Uh, well, thank you very much for listening. Everything that I presented here. <laughs> thank you well, very much. Well, we have so, time yeah. for a couple of questions. Yeah.
Uh, thank you for the talk. Uh, I wanted to ask you uh, about your vector. Do you have a begin and end, like iterators, to your vector? Yes, there are iterators. But um, it's const only, yes? Uh, yes, you can only read from them. You cannot write to them. Also, um, use them if you need to. If you can, I would recommend to use the for each functions provided by the library because they are more efficient. Actually, there was a talk yesterday uh, about uh, ranges, which um, also discuss how internal iteration, especially for tree-based data structures, uh, can be significantly more efficient. Uh, and this is why the library provides you know, its own for each function uh, and related iteration operations. But if you want to or need to uh, use iterators, you can. Yeah. And yeah. it's also not that slow. And the second question, can you please open uh, the slide with um, Oh, when you get uh, the key, uh, the key, and you then update your model like the loop, like uh, while true loop, in the main. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, I think uh, I see that you act uh, is uh, like next. Yeah. And then you redrawing your state every time, but. Uh, uh, act is an is a array of actions or only one action per, uh, per tick? I mean, it doesn't matter too much. In this case, it's just one. So, uh, yeah, it could be that you're seeing intermediate state if you had more actions. But this is something where, I mean, you can play a little bit w with and change when uh, this should redraw and not redraw for every action. Redraw after you got a bunch of them. Okay, thank you. Uh, hello, thanks for the awesome talk. Uh, I would ask about some details and uh, sorry if it's uh, not a real case, you know. <laughs> uh, actually, I want to ask about the undo uh, mm -hmm. and you are storing text um, mm, uh, as, uh, as a whole text or just uh, changes with the shared state as you did with Vector? Uh, it's a good question. So. From a conceptual point of view, you're storing the whole text, right? So as a programmer, you're not doing any slice or anything. You're storing the whole text. Uh, but in reality, because of the way the vector operations are implemented, it's actually sharing the internal representation between the different states. So uh, only the, the buffers that needed to be copied uh, from this tree structure that we showed in the beginning are actually different between the the states. So you could say that uh, uh, you're actually storing amount of data proportional to the amount of change. Uh, okay, so the, the main question, I think, what if uh, the amount of change is equal to the size of the content? For example, I'm uh, deleting and uh, pasting, uh, pasting it uh, and uh, repeating while my undo uh, query will grow up uh, infinitely. So <laughs> in that case, actually, no, because you're putting it in the clipboard also from the original vector, which means that when you're pasting it, it's still the original content, so you don't. And in a traditional text editor, that will not be the case, because in a traditional text editor, you will copy all the text in the clipboard and then paste it again. So in this case, yeah, it's even going to be more compact. It's not more compact in the general case, because I mean, a text edit action is normally very small. It's just one character. And here, you're copying a bunch of buffers. Um, but I think for this particular use case, it, it works very well. And in some cases, even better than in the, in the mutable case. Uh, so we are just uh, moving uh, back and, for and uh, forward uh, into the uh, undo qui and uh, this doesn't allow us to uh, undo qui doesn't grow because we are just uh, moving back and uh, we are in the same state yes exactly okay. yes exactly. and thank you awesome talk again thank you